PC, accounting for your future. Hi, this is Steve from APC, and in this video, we are going to be starting to have a look at the overview of the interest rate risk management in the exam. So, the interest rate risk management is what we're going to think about if the interest rate rises or falls and this will have an impact onto the company, so the company is going to hedge against it. For example, if the company is going to borrow some money from the bank, instead of paying for the bank 5%, but if the interest rate rises to 7%, this means the company will end up spending extra 2% of costs into borrowing those money and as a result of it, the company will suffer loss as a result of it. So the company is going to think about are there any ways that we're going to hedge against those risks. So before we dip into the hedging techniques overview, what we are going to do firstly is where we're going to start it to have a go at the interest rate yield curve. So what do I mean by interest rate yield curve is simply this. We are going to use the approaches to hedge against the interest rate risk, mainly for the LIBOR rate, which is the rate that is quoted by the bank. But it does not include the credit risk premium. So for example, if the bank, if we're going to borrow some money from the bank and the bank charges 7%, so what do the 7% actually include? Will include the LIBOR rate, as well as the credit risk premium. So what do I mean by that? For example, the LIBOR rate is to be 5%. But because the bank thinks that you're risky, lending you money would mean that the company will suffer, that the bank will suffer a risk that you're not going to pay back the money at some point in the future. So what the bank's gonna do is to charge you extra 2% to compensate for the risk they're currently suffering. So that's it. So the credit risk premium, we, we can hedge against that only to improve our financial performance and decrease our business risk. It's all about the strategy that the company is going to use. So that we are not going to use those hedging approaches, such as the fault rate agreement, such as the interest rate futures, to hedge against that credit risk premium because we cannot do that. So what we are going to do is where we're going to use those techniques, approaches, to hedge against the LIBOR rate. And of course the LIBOR rate can be plotted into the yield curve. Because of many factors, for example, different industries that you're in, different views about the inflation, and it will give rise to different shape of the yield curve related to the LIBOR rate. Of course we're going to look at that when we come to it. Using a LIBOR rate, of course, we can estimate the spot rate as well as calculating the fault rate. We're going to use quite a lot of these sophisticated mathematics to do that in the later sections related to the yield curve. And once we look at the yield curve, the next thing being, we are going to be starting to look at the bond valuation. So what do I mean by bond valuation? Is that if the company is going to borrow some money, Instead of going to the bank, of course the companies can borrow money from you. You are the investor. Of course you can spend your money away to buy my bond. Buy my corporate bond, in other words. If you go to buy my bond, how much I should charge you? If I'm going to decide to give you 5% of interests in each and every year, I'm going to give you $100 at the end of the fifth year, but how much you have to pay for me? How much I should borrow from you, in other words? So that's what I mean by bond valuation. So for example, the bond valuation is actually equals to $105. This means in order for you to have 5% of interest income in each and every year, you have to pay for me $105 at the start. Otherwise you cannot enjoy those income. So that's one of the bond valuation. So bond valuation is all based upon the yield curve that we just look at. Of course, we're going to use the techniques to hedge against 
this LIBOR rate. If it rises, of course, if we're going to borrow some money from the bank, we are afraid that the interest rate will rise. So we're going to use some approaches to do that. So that comes to the third part, is how we're going to hedge against the interest rate uh, risk uh, in this particular exam. So from the exam's point of view, your exam that is particularly focusing on the external hedging techniques that we're going to use. So, the external hedging techniques can be summarised into these two aspects from your exam's point of view. You can either lock the rate or you can cap the rate. There'll be two approaches there. Either you're going to lock that to a fixed rate or you're going to set a maximum that you are willing to pay for with regards to this particular hedge. So, if you decide to lock the rate, of course there are many approaches in there. Basically, there will be three approaches. Firstly, we can use the forward rate agreement. So what do I mean by forward rate agreement, which is the FRA, is that you're going to enter the contract with the bank. And what you're going to do is to say to the bank, well, in three months time, we are going to borrow some money from you at this rate. We're going to agree that rate today. So that whatever way changes in three months time, we still use the rates that we have currently agreed. That's the forward rate agreement. So, if this is the case, is that good or bad? Of course it's good, because we can fix the rate today, yes? So if the interest rate rises, that's nothing to do with me. But what if the interest rate, interest rate falls in three months time? So we still have to use the, uh, the rates that we agreed, for example 5%, but the interest rate falls to 3%. We still have to use 5% to borrow some money, and hence we end up with a loss. So, of course, locking the rate, if the interest rate actually falls in the future, we cannot benefit from those. So that's the disadvantage of the forward rate agreement, which is the FRA. The second of our way to lock the interest rate in the future is where we're going to use the interest rate future contract. So, what do I mean by interest rate future is simply like this. Future, of course, is related to future. So, futures markets, we can think about it in this way. So, if we, uh, for example, if we expect the interest rate will rise, from 5% to 8%. How are we going to do that? So, within the futures market, we're going to bet the interest rates will rise by 3%, from 5 to 8. But what if the interest rate will actually rise from 5 to 8 in 3 months' time? So, if that is the case, Within the actual market, if at that particular time that the interest rate rises by 3%, so of course, because we're going to borrow some money from the bank, so we have to end up borrow the money at 8% instead of 5%. So as a result of it, because the interest rate rises, but because we are borrowing some money, because the interest rate rises, and hence, Within the actual market, we will suffer a loss of 3%. You agree? Because instead of borrowing at 5%, we now have to pay for 8%. But what about for the futures market? Because we bet the interest rate to rise, and it actually rises. So my thought is correct. If I am correct, I win. If I win, that would be the benefit of 3% that given to us. That's how the futures market actually works. And why do we call it as the hedging? It's simply because we can use the income from the futures market to offset against the 
uh, losses that we've incurred in the actual market and hence we end up paying nothing as a result of it in increasing the uh, interest rate. But the question is why we call it as the locking into rate. It's simply because for the futures market, uh, for the interest rate futures market, it would be the futures contract in March, June, September as well as the December. And for each of these contracts, there would be a particular price attached to it. And from the investor's point of view, what we are going to do is we're going to start to enter into that contract at that particular price. So that of course we can exercise that particular contract at the fixed price that we've just entered into. The price would be the interest rates that we're currently looking at here. Of course, I'm going to go through quite a few questions later on in the next of our video about the interest rate future contracts in much more detail. So the third way that we're going to lock the rates is we're going to use the interest rate swap. So what do I mean by interest rate swap is what I mean by interest rate exchange. So we're going to exchange the interest rates with another party. For example, if I prefer the floating rates of the interest, for example, we're going to prefer the, uh, the interest rates uh, rises or falls, uh, we're not going to fix it. So that's what I mean by floating rate. So floating rates, for example, uh, we are we are thinking about, so for example, if we're going to borrow some money from the bank, we're thinking about the interest rate may fall at some point in the future, so we're going to enter into the floating rate agreement. But for another party, they prefer the fixed rate, for example, because they think that if they borrow some money, they expect the interest rate to rise, so they're going to uh, enter into a contract today to fix the interest rate uh, at the low uh, level, uh, so that they don't have to end up with the losses at some point in the future. So what we tend to do here is that we think that if we're going to enter into a floating rate in our country, it's relatively expensive. But if I enter into a floating rate agreement in their country, so the country B, which is the other party, it would be cheaper and vice versa. So we're going to agree with each other to borrow some money. So for example, if I want the floating rate, I borrow the fixed rate for them, and they borrow the floating rate for me, and we're going to exchange with each other. So for example, with interest rate swap, we will end up with the total cost is to be 5%. But if without the interest rate swap, there will be a total cost of 7%. As a result of it, as a result of this swap agreement, we can save 2% of the expenses out of it, so that 2% will be the income, isn't it? So 2% will be split between these two parties, uh, for one for me and one for him. Okay, so that's what I mean by interest rate swap. Of course, we're going to look at quite a few questions related to that later when we come to it. So, with regards to the capital rate, of course, there will be another three ways that we can do it. Firstly, we can use the interest rate guarantee. to do it. So interest rate guarantee simply means that we're going to pay the maximum of interest expenses set up by the contract. For example, set in the contract, the maximum you're going to pay is to be 5%. So even though the interest rate actually increases to 11%, but you still need to pay 5%, it's the maximum they're going to pay for. Secondly, we can use the interest rate option. This is all based upon the interest rate futures market that we just looked at before. So what do I mean by option is the option, is the choice, it is not an obligation. So for example, you enter into the interest rate options contract and you think that if the interest rates actually rises to 5%, so you will end up with the losses. So what you're going to do is to exercise this interest rate option to enter into the interest rates of only 3% rather than 5%. So if you think that uh, the interest rate option needs to be 6%, but the actual interest rate is to be 7%, so 
So what you're going to do is go to exercise this contract again. But if your interest rate option is 7%, but the actual interest rate is to be 6%, if you're going to borrow some money, of course, you're not going to exercise this options contract. It's entirely up to you. Okay, so interest rate options contract. And finally, we've also got the interest rate color hedge. So what do I mean by interest rate color hedge? It's all based upon the interest rate option contracts that we just look at. The interest rate option contract, you, you will have that option if you give me some of the premiums. So premium is a lump sum of money, such as the administration expenses. But that's too expensive to put up with you. So what we're going to do then is we're going to enter into the interest rate color hedge. So instead of just paying for the premium, we're going to receive the premium from another party as the income to offset against those expenses that we've incurred. Those are the instructions to the hedging techniques. So, but before we move any further, I'd like to take you uh, uh, one step further for the summary of those uh, hedging techniques. What are the approaches that we're going to use, especially for the future, especially for the option, especially for the interest rate call hedge, because those will be examined again and again in each and every sitting, and make sure that you're happy with that. Of course, here at APC, we have got our own approaches to uh, deal with those matters. We're going to use a mnemonic, all based upon APC, or going to swap the way around. So let's think about it this way. Firstly, for the interest rate futures market, we're going to use the mnemonic called CPA. Firstly, we're going to consider the action. Consider the actions is where we're going to either borrow some money from the others, or we're going to deposit money into the bank. And once you look at that, of course, the P, it stands for the profit or losses from the futures market. Of course, we're going to start working related to that. Okay. To do the actual calculation for that. And once we've done that, we've got the actual cost to the company. So that's the approaches for the futures market. Of course, we have got the options uh, on future as well. The option on future is what we're going to use in Monarch again. It's called CPPA. So firstly, we're going to consider the action that's available, such as what we've seen in the uh, futures contract. Either we're going to borrow some money or we're going to deposit our money. And then we're going to account for the uh, profit losses. From the futures market. So profit losses from the futures market, if this is the OTC contract, which means it's not based upon the uh, derivative market, of course we're going to ignore it. But if this is the this is not the OTC contract, which means we're going to enter into the interest rate options on the actual futures market, we're going to include the PL. Thirdly, which is the premium that we're going to pay for in order to enter into the options contract. And finally, which is the actual cost to the complex. So that's the option. And for the interest rate collar hedge, we are going to use APC, mnemonic. Okay, it's quite interesting, I hope. So APC stands for, firstly, what is the actual interest rate? And P stands for the premium is the uh, premium net off against the premium that we pay and the premium that we receive from the other party. And once you've done that, of course, we also need to uh, uh, understand the compensation to or from another party. Because, for example, if we enter into the put option, which is the option to sell, is to be the maximum is to be eight percent, but the interest rate actually rises to eleven percent. This means that we only need to pay eight percent in order to borrow some money from the bank, and hence, of course, because the interest rate rises, so the bank will compensate for us three percent. 
So that's the C, compensation to or from. Of course, we're going to summarise those together, and that gives us the actual. Of course, we are going to deal with uh, those bits and pieces in later questions. That's uh, no problem for that. Okay, so those are the ways that we're going to approach the question and uh, approach each type of these hedging techniques. Now, of course, we're going to deal with that in the later videos. And that's just the introduction to the interest rate risk management and make sure that you're happy with those aspects before you go to the example. APC, accounting for your future.